Well, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for inviting us to give this presentation today. Uh, and a special regard to John Rex and John Tomiko, who put us up to this. Um, uh, so we're asked today to come and talk about the challenges related to CMC in drug development. And CMC is Chemistry Manufacturing and Controls. We'll talk a little bit about what each of those means over the course of our presentation today. Uh, we note with great enthusiasm the uh, changes to the regulatory environment and clinical trial testing uh, for antibiotics in response to the rise of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Uh, we can now envision uh, smaller, more focused trials with a wider NI margin, which is tremendous in encouraging us to, to develop drugs for these high unmet need uh, infections. However, we do note uh, and appreciate and understand that Despite the uh, easing up of requirements in some areas, that has no effect on others. So certainly in CMC, our obligations remain the same. We have to show that the drug is uh, consistently pure and has the potency that we expect. Moreover, uh, we have to have excellence in non-clinical development and PKPD to substantiate the activities that are ongoing in the clinic. Uh, so while we might have a redu reduced uh, obligation in terms of total number of patients, and certainly possibly in the total time to market, uh, we nonetheless have the same requirements elsewhere. Here's just a quick uh, 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 note of uh, the presenters we're speaking with um, and our, our, our uh, various conflicts. Today's session, uh, just to get us ready for this, um, what we've decided to do is take X1, which was presented, I believe, at this uh, forum last year, uh, and in-license it. Uh, so those of, those of us in this room are all part of the development team for X1. Um, our company has uh, just brought it in, and this is the kickoff meeting. We're sharing everything we know about X1 with this group. Uh, moreover, um, we're going to describe all the work that's necessary to get it to the next stage. We're going into phase three for X1, uh, and so far in the course of this meeting, our non-clinical colleagues and our clinical colleagues have made their presentations. And now it's up to us to talk you through uh, what's going to be needed for, uh, for the clinic. Very importantly to us, uh, the company that developed X1 originally was pretty small and was interested in selling uh, at a certain point. Therefore, some of the activities that a larger company might otherwise do prior to entering an IND phase have been left for later. Uh, they uh, preferentially put their, uh, their budget against the clinical trials, which uh, has a, uh, the benefit of increasing the value of the asset a lot more than a stability study might otherwise. Um, Y'all have your HERGs and log Ps, but we have also a special language in CMC. Uh, these are just some common acronyms. Uh, we're going to be uh, using a fair number of acronyms over the course of this. I know that these are, many of them, familiar to you all, um, but also know that you're going to be, uh, have access to these slides, so we won't spend much time on them. There are some frightening ones, though. RSMs and SMs can really uh, change us radically over the course of time. So when our regulatory starting materials uh, are deemed GMP, that might take us a little a few steps backward in the synthesis uh, for our GMP work, not to be too, uh, uh, too scary. So with that, we'll turn over to our, uh, our uh, drug company's presentation. You can tell it's a drug company because we have our logo in the bottom right. Uh, you can also tell we're a small company because we had an intern develop it. Uh, <laughs> Now, we've just come back from break, uh, and we're going to briefly summarize the clinical program uh, to date and also the planned trials forward. So I'll uh, pretend to be in the clinic. These are the studies that were described last year uh, up through the phase two in cystic fibrosis and the planning for uh, phase one QT as well. It's, you see that uh, X1 has been very well tolerated, and there was a predicted dose of 100 milligrams TID. Uh, coming out of that cystic fibrosis study. That said, uh, who in the audience is our PKPD modeler? Can I see a show of hands of PKPD people? Yes, uh, thank you. Because of the work that you did in reestablishing uh, the dose rationale, uh, we decided to target not 40% time over MIC, but 50% time over MIC. Uh, and you see in the VAP trial later on, and also a multi of infection trial, we're going to target a dose of 150 milligrams TID rather than 100. This is a modest increase in total dose uh, given to each subject, and is certainly well covered by our therapeutic index. I will note that a chill just went down the spine of the CMC people who see this as a 50% increase in what we have to deliver. 
at the same cost. <laughs> and time. <laughs> so briefly uh, drilling into the phase three uh, clinical trials, uh, we were fortunate to have a quick design. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this will be uh, a tier B type product, so a, a modest sized VAP trial, ventilator pneumonia of about 580 patients. Uh, this is randomized one-to-one -one against uh, comparator, uh, and dosing will be 150 milligrams TID over 14 days. We're gonna target 200 sites because of the horrible rate of enrollment in VAP of 0.1 patients per site per month, and we anticipate being able to start this trial a year from now, in third quarter 2018, isn't that great. And we're gonna do that for about two years uh, and read out in second quarter of 2020. Our multi-site of infection study, by contrast, is randomized two to one against best available therapy. Again, we're testing 150 milligrams TID for 14 days and about 50 sites. Uh, our enrollment rate is tough to, uh, to gauge on this study because we are targeting multi-drug resistant pseudomonas. We're fortunate, however, that we have an as yet unapproved a diagnostic that will give you 100% reliability at bedside. Uh, and as long as we're in the uh, realm of uh, of hoping, we might as well try to get the, um, our tonight's uh, lotto as well. So what are the drug requirements then for, for these phase three studies only? Uh, again, for the, the VAP trial, 290 patients three times a day for 14 days, gives us a little over 12,000 vials uh, that will be used. Uh, the multi-site of infection is about 5,000 vials. But by rule of thumb, in the clinic, we'll go ahead and apply a 30% overage to that to account for sites that don't enroll or at which the, uh, the drug goes out of expiry over time. So we reckon that we're gonna need a little over 22,000 vials. And very helpfully, we've decided to kind of convert that into API units for the CMC team, and we'll require about 3.4 kilos of active drug in vials to execute on our phase three program. So with that, I'll pause and turn it over to my colleague, Evan Hecker, uh, who is our API guy. Evan is a graduate of University of Texas at Austin and then did his postdoc at uh, Harvard. After Harvard, he went to Cubist, then Cary Farm, and is now employed at Sparrow Therapeutics. Evan. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, first off, I'll uh, start off by saying that I am a chemist, and uh, this, I think, is the first presentation I've ever given uh, that doesn't have a structure. So I was grateful for the chemist earlier today that had structures. I could actually understand something that was on the slides. Um, having said that, uh, this is uh, a compound X1 is a complex antibiotic that does have a structure, though we will not show it. Um, and one of the things uh, I'll, I'll uh, allude back to is earlier references to getting uh, the CMC folks involved earlier. And the earlier you get us involved, uh, the, the better off uh, we are. <laughs> And regulatory, and regulatory. And regulatory. So um, earlier you heard about getting the CMC folks involved uh, to start looking at the chemistry, to start thinking about how they're going to uh, produce materials, to consider um, how they're going to supply the plans um, that, the, that the clinical team and the project team have. Um, and so when we in-licensed the drug X1, first thing we did uh, from the CMC side, is to begin to look at um, what had been made uh, and what quality had been made and how they had made it. So one of the first things the CMC team was engaged on was to supply some scale-up toxicology studies. So the early pharmacology work was done using lot 12345, um, which required about 50 grams of the API and was largely done uh, by taking what the medicinal chemists had done um, and directly uh, transferring that to slightly bigger uh, round bottom flasks. So chemists uh, in the lab, if you've walked through a lab or ever seen a corporate presentation from a pharmaceutical company, inevitably you see somebody with goggles looking at a little piece of glass with some orange liquid floating in it, or maybe something spinning with a similarly orange liquid in it. Um, and those round bottom flasks uh, are what the medicinal chemists often use to produce their drugs. Um, as you get larger and larger in scale, the round bottom flasks get heavier and heavier, and they're harder and harder to carry around with orange liquid on it. So uh, we moved towards fixed equipment. 
So about 50 grams to 250 grams for the next deliverable, you may be thinking about maintaining it in round bottom flasks. But at some point after that, you have to think about your fixed equipment, even if it's smaller than uh, the big manufacturing plants um, that uh, Genzyme may have nearby or Vertex or other places. Having said that, 50 grams uh, supplied the pharmacology studies um, that you heard about during lead optimization to round out the data package to understand the properties of the molecule and get the data package ready for an IND filing. The 250 gram batch, 23456, um, was used to generate uh, toxicology data, sometimes uh, we'll do a 14-day study, and that will be used to not only show that the drug is safe for 14 days dose, but also to qualify impurities. So that's an important point, um, because what that means is from that point forward, you've made a commitment to the quality of the material uh, that you'll be producing. So if you have 250 grams of 100% pure material, then when you produce 98% pure material for your phase one, you better know what that 2% is and know that you're not going to poison somebody. Uh, for a variety of reasons, nobody wants to poison anybody. But also, uh, you wanna know that that 2% um, isn't going to be uh, not only toxic, but is going to degrade um, your main component. So there's a lot of things that go into understanding your GLP tox lot that will not only enable the toxicology package, so this 250 gram lot um, uh, will also go on stability, and this will probably be the first time you get a sense of whether your drug is stable. And not stable um, in a vial in the back, but stable for long-term storage. How are we going to handle the drug? And eventually that information leads into how are we going to formulate the drug. If it's not stable, then you need to add excipients. You need to handle it carefully. You need to prepare it and formulate it in such a way. Uh, maybe it has to be lyophilized, or maybe it can be stored as a liquid. But all the data you get during this early phase, even well before you're into people, uh, enables all of those decisions down the road. So you don't want to take them too lightly. We've also retained 20 grams of that lot because, as I said, it sets our impurity profile. So any lot we make from now on will be ultimately compared against this lot. So we have to maintain um, a good, good control over the quality of the material to ensure that it always meets or exceeds this quality. Our phase one, our phase one supply was two kilos. This was batch three, four, five, six, seven. And this was also to the GMP standard. So the FDA uh, asks that you uh, consider how you make your material uh, to good manufacturing practices. And that really, for the purposes of this meeting, um, means that we're going to be keeping track of everything that goes in, everything that leaves, all of the equipment that's used, the people that touched it, the access to the equipment, the access to the materials. Um, uh, GMP really means great mounds of paper, and, and that's really what it is. Uh, you, you compile a huge package that, that convinces yourself, the FDA, and everybody involved that you know what you're doing and that you've made the right material. And then uh, accordingly, we had uh, significant uh, uh, work that went into converting the two kilos of API to two lots of drug product, which in this case are 100 milligram vials. And in each of these cases, anytime you're putting something uh, into people, the FDA wants you to, and all regulators want you to make sure that it's stable and so that during the duration of the study, it hasn't degraded, uh, not only so that you know that the material you're testing was efficacious at the end of the study, but then also that you didn't give somebody some toxic impurities. Um, so this is all of the package we have from X1, which we're obviously going to need to expand, but this enabled us to get to where we are and enables us to evaluate uh, our package thus far. Um, so what this doesn't have on here is cost, and that's something that uh, uh, the regulators don't really concern themselves with. That's our problem as a company. And what I mean by that is uh, right now the cost of X1 is about $1,000 a gram, um, which really means that uh, to make two kilos is $2 million. 
Uh, that's just for bulk material, and that doesn't include the ongoing stability studies or the work that it takes to get it into the vial or the uh, clinical supply chain to ship those vials and maintain them at the site. So that's just $2 million to get a bag of hopefully white powder. So the current drug product, as I said, um, uh, based on the stability data you'll get out of your GLP tox, may need to have excipients or be formulated to a certain extent. In this case, X1 did none of that work, and they just violated the material, which is to say they took your white powder, dissolved it in liquid, filtered it, put it into a vial, and then lyophilized it to leave the powder in the vial. So the cake is inelegant, um, which means instead of looking like a nice cake that uh, many people may have seen in a clinic in the vials that's ready for reconstitution, this is just a clumpy powder in there which is not gonna be good as we uh, think about commercialization for our market image. And the current stability data suggests that we have 15 months expiry at refrigerated conditions. So obviously we're continuing to monitor this, but by taking the materials we have and force degrading them and putting them on accelerated conditions, we've established that we believe that the material will be safe and efficacious for 15, minute, 15 months, hopefully longer than 15 minutes. <laughs> So um, this is, uh, I'm not immune to using a Google search um, as well. So uh, over the course of uh, prior um, places, uh, done some Google searching and compiled this list with other colleagues to come up with what we called uh, a technical stage gate deliverables. So this is kind of what we're using um, to map our progress, both for internal projects that we're bringing to market as well as uh, projects that we've been licensed. So what this allows us to do is pretty quickly say um, which, um, well, maybe I'm too fast, which, which uh, of these things do we have and which of them do we still need to do. So you can see it's kind of broken down by each phase of development. So we have here all the way on the left our pre-candidate nomination where we're establishing our API form, which is how we're going to isolate the material. Um, we're technology transferring the material from the discovery chemists um, and biologists, understanding the chemistry they use to produce it, any knowledge they have about the stability. Uh, we're producing the material for the uh, GLP studies um, and, and the non-clinical formulations. Um, and then as you get along, you can see the list gets longer and longer. And that's, uh, that has a lot to do with um, the C in CMC, well, the second C in CMC. The first C is chemistry, and, and chemistry is, um, uh, uh, is an important part. Manufacturing uh, is reducing that chemistry to a product. And the last C, control, is the most important one because uh, that's really what everybody, um, uh, the regulators and the clinicians really care about, is control. And so to prove that you have control, you have to generate a lot of data, and that's what a lot of these uh, deliverables are about. So this is where we are uh, in licensing, which is to say uh, that some of these have already been accomplished, these shaded out ones, but here we are about to enter phase three, and we don't have our phase three clinical trial material. We haven't done a preliminary cost of goods assessment, or at least we know that it's really, really far off from where anybody would want to be. Uh, we have not put together our CMC development plan, which we're sharing with you now, um, and we haven't really established a scalable API process. I can tell you that two kilos from 250 grams is, is a good uh, achievable um, goal, um, but it does not necessarily constitute a scalable API process. And, and then uh, a lot of these things in here, so we heard reference to starting materials. Um, our manufacturing costs, so this goes above and beyond um, just the, the materials, but also the drug product costs. Um, a market image definition, so again, if the cake is inelegant, what, how do you do to improve that? So, um, uh, where is it, there we go. So a launch strategy, so how do we get from where we are for clinical material supply to validation and then supplying the market? registrational batches on stability, and so on. There's a long list of activities here that uh, need to be folded into, aside from just making sure that the clinic has uh, the drug it needs. Having said that, uh, the project team assembled here today is mostly interested in this timeline, which is to say, how do we supply the clinic? 
So this is a timeline assuming the clinical plan that we've heard earlier, um, which uh, enables us to supply phase three. So you can see these are long lead time items. So they take a long time not only to line up, but to execute on. Um, and I once had a manager who once said that everything is on a timeline except a management decision. Uh, and so what I mean by that is, uh, this is what we're proposing to do, but until management says, yes, go spend millions of dollars, this timeline keeps moving out. Um, and so uh, for all the managers in the room, uh, uh, we need to be able to execute on API production, which really, even though you can see it's starting in the third quarter of 2018, is fed by activities starting now. So uh, these are long lead time items that uh, we're working very hard to achieve. Um, there's, uh, based on what we've done so far uh, in, in licensing X1, we have um, a three-stage API production. We have to source our starting materials. So these are, every chemical in the world is coming from the earth in one form or another, whether it's coal or tar uh, or oil, dis petroleum distillates or amino acids from fermentation. Um, even if we think about opening a Sigma Aldrich catalog and finding some really complex molecule for $500 a gram, we have to find a way to source that all the way from earth, wind, and fire uh, to get to larger scale uh, materials. And that takes a long time, especially at early stage when you haven't established a supply chain. So as you can see, that's actually the longest lead time here. So if you think about uh, cephalosporins, um, I, I'm not sure if all, but uh, most cephalosporins are manufactured actually from uh, a penicillin fermentation intermediate that then is converted to a cephalosporin core, which then you attach the left side uh, aminothiodiazole and the right side tail, um, and that, all that takes its own lead times for all those pieces. So in those other pieces are what I would call intermediate manufacturing. So these are going to be the things that uh, from earth, wind, and fire to late stage compounds, maybe your medicinal chemist would have used to diversify. So as we heard earlier, there's a lot that goes into finding hits, identifying those hits that can be leads, optimizing those leads, and, and none of that really detailed the actual chemistry that goes into it. And a lot of times, uh, medicinal chemists, what they'll do is they'll stage intermediates for late stage diversification. So they can make 50 grams of one intermediate and then make 35 analogs from each of those. Uh, for us, for early scale up, we'll often leverage that, uh, that, that pipeline, recognizing that that's not going to be a viable solution for long term. So that's what that means by intermediate uh, manufacturing. And then we have all of our uh, drug product activities. So we're going to do our method development and transfer. We're going to tech transfer um, the uh, drug product process, which involves um, inevitably doing a demonstration batch, making sure that the new facility can produce the vials you want, making sure that they're sterile and, and usable for the clinic. So this is where we were when we in-licensed the compound. This is what uh, X1 was used to make uh, GMP material for the clinic. Starting from raw materials, there was a six-month lead time to this uh, medicinal chemistry intermediate, the one that they were using for diversification. From there, uh, we've identified what we're going to call our GMP starting material, uh, our building blocks that we're going to start our GMP production for. And that takes about three months to convert to the intermediate. And then after that, uh, we're going to undergo our GMP production. Now, GMP production usually for early phase, when you haven't optimized and you don't really know much about your process, a rule of thumb is about one month per step. So in this case, uh, we've uh, identified a commodity CMO, which can produce the earth, wind, and fire to intermediates, our Chinese CMO, which will do our key intermediates on large scale affordably, and then a US-based API supplier to produce the actual drug. The issues here are obviously cost. We heard earlier $1,000 a gram or a million dollars a kilo. Scalability, so we're relying on a lot of different um, issues uh, that were identified in the medicinal chemistry route but are able to be overcome uh, uh, for, for the scales that we had uh, earlier phase but are not going to be suitable for longer uh, timeline deliverables. So how do we get from where we are to a commercializable uh, API process? So really, there's three priorities when you're thinking about developing uh, your supply chain and, and getting ready for commercialization. Priority number one is always to supply the clinic. 
Um, somebody once told me that you never want to be between a patient on a clinical trial and their drug on that clinical trial. It's a horrible place to be. Uh, and so we have to supply the clinic to make sure that every study that everybody else wants to do gets well supplied so that we can actually file the NDA. Priority number two is to support this clinical development. So that means supplying materials to, um, for our analytical and formulation colleagues to do an environmental health and safety assessment, uh, any tox activities that may be needed to fill out our NDA package, as well as generating the data to support the clinical supplies and the ongoing studies. And then priority three is just planning for commercial, which is not a big deal. <laughs> so supplying the clinic. So uh, as we said earlier, API is the longest lead time of any of these activities. Uh, and what you can see here is that the longest part of this is really the raw materials. So as we said, if we're talking about uh, taking our medicinal chemistry process, where we have some intermediate that was used for diversification, we can identify ways to cut that out. So what I mean by that is for early phase, you're going to want to stage materials. This is a big at-risk uh, activity. This means you're going to have to spend money that doesn't lead to clinical material. This just sets you up to be able to supply things later on. Um, and so one of the things we'll do to shorten this timeline is even if we only need 3.4 kilos to supply drug product, we're going to target a lot more material at the early stage so that when the clinic stocks out or the trial needs to expand or one shipment uh, falls into the ocean, we're able to quickly supply more. So again, a rule of thumb is about one month per GMP step. At early phase development, you're usually going to target two to three steps for uh, GMP production. Um, usually regulators may want you to do more to show that you have control over your process. But for early phase, um, more importantly, if you can show that you have good quality material, you're, it's acceptable um, uh, to do only a few steps. And then usually about a month for release, especially uh, for a vial where you're going to need to do endotoxin and uh, microbial bio burden. So for phase three and beyond, we're going to need to agree to the GMP starting materials the regulatory, uh, with the regulatory authorities, which there's been some perspective papers and there's a lot of work done um, uh, to align, but not yet there, the uh, FDA and the EMA and, and other regulatory agencies' expectations for this. But needless to say, if you want your drug approved in all these markets, you have to appease all of the regulators. So again, priority number one is to supply the clinic. The clinical trial material was estimated to require four kilos of active material. So we're going to target 2x not only to mitigate the drug product batch failures and, and losses in that, but also to support the stability and, and uh, any other needs uh, the, the teams may need. So one consideration that we're going to, need to decide as a team is do we do this all in one batch? Do we spend what would be at this point, uh, 2x would be almost $10 million to produce uh, API um, with the current process we have, or do we make small, smaller batches now to get the trial started and then invest some of that money in process development to decrease the cost, uh, streamline the supply chain, and enable later stage development? So can we afford this? Can we afford not to do this? So this is a balance that, that all project teams are going to have to establish. What improvements can we make without impacting our timeline? So are there low-hanging fruits? So we got 40% yield, or we have an HPLC purification that uh, requires three weeks in the plant, and for every day in the plant, you're paying a set amount, regardless uh, of your yields. Uh, so you need to invest early to avoid all of these things. So things like esoteric equipment. So for early phase clinical deliverables, you may be purifying uh, by preparatory HPLC. Um, as you scale up, those equipments become rarer and rarer and more expensive. Ion exchange chromatography, reverse osmosis, many of these things are, are quite popular, uh, especially for fermentation products, um, uh, but they're also uh, not exactly standard equipment in API processing, and that becomes more expensive, and it limits the supply chain choices you have. So priority number two, supporting the clinical development. So we need to generate data to support the clinical supplies that are already out there. So this means stability and impurity tracking. So to make sure that when we're dosing a patient, we're not giving them something we don't want to give them. Um, we need to uh, also keep track if there is a new impurity. We need to generate data that says that this impurity is safe or that it's qualified to the levels that we've said uh, uh, we're using this material. So specific uh, to this are things like GTIs, genotoxic impurities. 
So uh, in recent years, uh, there's been new guidance um, that, that uh, uh, is, is tougher on the requirements and the burden on the data package you have to present. So you have to even um, generate a package that gives the regulators confidence that you've thought of every possible um, iteration of your process and your API and the impurities to make sure that you're not giving anybody anything that could alter their DNA, which nobody wants to do. Uh, unless it's the X-Men. So end of phase two will be an opportunity to review control strategy with the FDA. So that's genotoxic impurities. Uh, that's also um, your overall specifications. That's things like um, uh, which solvents you're using uh, and removing at which steps, which uh, impurities uh, you're crystallizing away, all of thing, these things like that. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, if, you, if your material that you make on 10 kilo scale doesn't meet the specifications, uh, your yield is actually zero, and nobody wants to spend $10 million to have no material out of that. So um, what I hope this slide begins to share, show you um, is that for CMC folks, data is actually more important than kilos. Um, the kilos that we produce um, are useless without the data that supports it. So if you can't convince uh, a regulator or a patient or uh, your colleagues that you know everything about how the material was made and that there's not 2% uh, arsenic or 4% um, osmium tetroxide or uh, chromium-6 or all these other things that nobody wants to take as part of their drug, uh, then you're going to have a problem. And that means even things like making sure that the equipment uh, you're running your chemistry in doesn't leach materials into the uh, drug that the chemistry you're pr producing um, doesn't uh, extract uh, metals from the containers that it's in. So all of this data package goes above and beyond the material that you're supplying to the clinic. So uh, all of this data and the material that we may need to go into uh, this clinical development work, um, things like um, a validation of analytical methods and tech transfer, um, qualifying new process impurities through the course of your development. So as we said uh, earlier, it's about a million dollars per kilo. That's not acceptable for anybody. So as we work towards cutting that in half and then cutting that in half again and cutting that in half again, uh, we really start to think about what is acceptable. And what I mean by that is maybe to get to a million dollars a kilo for your HPLC purification, your material was pristine, really, really clean. Well. Uh, if you're going to be willing to spend $100,000 a kilo, maybe you can't get to 100% purity, maybe you can only get to 98% purity, and is that acceptable? Are those 2% impurities uh, safe? And if they are, how do you prove that they're safe? So all of this information and data package you need to generate uh, requires material, and that material does not have to be GMP, which uh, brings it down, but the ideal plan aligns all of these activities so that you're supplying the clinic while you're supplying your tox colleagues, while you're supplying analytical development. And then finally, as I said, the easy part, planning for commercial. So this is tech transferring to your commercial site after a selection process. So this is usually a lengthy process because you want to make sure that they have a regulatory history, that they have, uh, that they're not going to screw up your project, that their FDA is going to come through a pre-approval inspection and say, yep, you're ready to go and, and we are going to allow you to sell this drug on the market. So that requires detailed process descriptions, uh, specific temperature ranges for uh, each step, the amount of solvents that are acceptable, the amount of reagents that are acceptable, uh, specifications at each step along the way. Uh, and you're going to need to do this. This is a lot of work, and you're going to learn in an iterative process along the way. So you're going to need to establish some time in the timeline for this. So the current overall process yield is 15%, we're assuming. So we're going to start to uh, think about this in terms of how do we get from where we are to a commercial process. Um, we're going to do development to improve the yields, but also control. Because as I said, no, no regulars, regulators tend not to care about your cost per vial. What they care about is the control of that material. And so if you produce 100% pure material every time, but batch one was 15% yield and batch two was 90% yield, Somebody will look at it and say, oh, you've got really clean material. We know you're doing things safe. But if you've got such a wide variation in your process output, you don't have control over that process. 
And if you don't have control over that process, how do you ensure that there's not something in there you didn't know about, that you're not going to have something go wrong when you're uh, in the clinic or on market? So you have to not only show that the material is of good quality, but that you have good control over the process. So you're going to do a scalability assessment and production planning. So one of the big things here is volumetric efficiency. What I mean by that is how much volume, how big the vessels need to be to produce the amount of material you have. So we wanted to produce 8 to 10 kilos for our API. Well, if our volumetric efficiency or our Vmax of our biggest step is 10x, meaning we need 10 liters per kilo, we can do this in an 80 liter or 100 liter piece of glassware, which is probably about this big. If it's 100x or 1,000x, then up and up we go. To produce 10 kilos, you're going to need to be in a 1,000 liter glassware, which is the size of this room. Not this way. but uh, and, if it's, and if it's even longer, then yes, obviously, you're going to need a basilica uh, of solvent to produce the material. And, and that's a real example. Uh, we actually had a colleague uh, take a look at a process and, and say, we're going to need a basilica of acetonitrile. Um, which is not a good situation to be in per batch. Because I'm not aware of any basilica that's involved with API manufacturing. So again, we're going to try and align these activities, our scalability assessment, our improvements in volumetric efficiencies with our clinical resupply, and hopefully be able to do all this so we can supply registration material. So that's our commitment to the regulators on what our process capabilities are and put that material on stability. And ideally, you want that material to be in the clinic. And then finally, we're going to really target our NDA enabling process development. So this is firming up our total package. So this goes into the NDA. This is your specification justification. So you say you're going to accept 410 parts per million of acetonitrile per batch. Why? How, how do you know you're always going to make 410 parts per million? And why do you think that's an acceptable amount? You have an impurity in there at 0.25%. How do you know it's never going to be 0.28%? Because the FDA is not going to be reviewing every batch. How do you know that every single time, if you produce a batch that's at 0.15%, that it won't increase on stability to get to over 0.25% and then give a toxic level of impurity to a patient? So this is all of your normal operating ranges and proven acceptable ranges, which uh, sometimes people lump into under the umbrella of quality by design or QBD, which is a new uh, um, mode of process development. Um, but ultimately, uh, regulators still want to see three validation batches. That's a validation batch is where you've assigned your commercial production uh, planning, and you've demonstrated that on commercial scale, you can produce three batches of acceptable quality. And then finally, your GMP building block justification, your regulatory starting materials and the justification for that. So why do you think that you only need three or four steps under GMP? And why do you think it's acceptable to buy that late stage cephalosporin core from this uh, Indian or Chinese manufacturer that has never been inspected by the FDA? And why do you think it's acceptable to have a custom made tail for your novel carbapenem that is sourced out of a small shop in Taiwan? And how do you know that every single time that Taiwanese shop is going to produce the same quality of material? And this for fermentation product that you have that's a natural product that you do semi-synthesis on, how do you know that the fermentation is going to produce the same quality every single time if you're not running this under GMP? So all of this data needs to be generated to convince the regulators that you're doing uh, GMP production at the appropriate point. So finally, um, you've done all of this work, you've consolidated your supply chain, you've identified key opportunities for improvement, and you've established what your final API supply chain will be. So this is now, we're taking earth, wind, and fire, and we're converting it directly to what we've established as our regulatory starting material. We've cut out uh, the intermediate manufacturing, we've enabled a process that targets our API and the GMP process directly, rather than going through those common intermediates. Um, we've identified two Chinese CMOs, uh, which Chinese manufacturing would be uh, cheaper than in the US or EU. So we've established two Chinese CMOs that will enable us to make our GMP building blocks more affordably than elsewhere. And we have confidence in our validatable process should regulators push us back. So even though we're not doing GMP work with these Chinese CMOs, 
if we get pushback, we can reliably go to them and say, uh, we need you to produce this material GMP, and, and we'll have confidence they can do that. We've also developed a new crystallization which avoids esoteric processing. So we no longer need the expensive equipment that enables us to broaden our supply chain. We're no longer tied to specific manufacturers with specific capabilities. We've identified multiple standard fixed equipment manufacturers. So without having, relying on those uh, uh, esoteric equipment, we can go anywhere and price to bid. And as long as they have a regulatory history and confidence that they can deliver the quality, we can validate multiple partners to establish uh, uh, secondary suppliers and security of supply. And finally, you'll notice the GMP step, even though it may be more steps now, is only two months. And what we've been able to do through our process development is campaign. And what that means is usually in manufacturing, you have a facility that can be four or five stories tall. And in the top, there's a big reactor, a big piece of glass where materials will go in, they come out the bottom, they go into another piece of glass, they go out the bottom, they go into a centrifuge, they go out the bottom into a dryer, they go out the bottom into a big bag. And what that allows you to do is, in the big bag you have one batch, in the dryer you have another batch, in the crystallizer you have another batch, in the other vessel you've got another batch. You can be running four or five batches at once. So what once took you one month per step, now may take you four or five days per step. So you're enabled to cut down on your costs, by through some of which economies of scale, but you were able to uh, scale, but you're able to do that through all the process development and data you generated. So with that, uh, we've now established our, uh, our goal for our commercial API supply chain. Um, and API is no good to anybody unless it's properly formulated. So I'll turn this over to our drug product lead, Mike Young. Great. Thank you, Evan. Uh, Mike is gonna now speak about drug product challenges. Uh, Mike is a graduate of the Worcester Polytechnic Institute, um, the mascot of which is Gompe the Goat, I understand. Uh, in chemical engineering, he began his career at Pfizer and then did a stint starting in 2007 at Cubist. I'm told that his therapist will now let him talk about the experience of dedicating a drug product facility on a very, very tight timeline uh, that he uh, almost single-handedly did. Uh, currently, he's uh, Vice President of Operations at Tedor Pharmaceuticals in Rhode Island, and thank you for joining us, Mike. Thank you. Good afternoon. So as part of this scenario, I'm here to discuss the crazy world of commercial manufacturing that I've been started to get into a little bit here. Um, my job is really to take the lab scale process and to turn it into a process that we can use in humans and make quantities enough for the market forecast. So hopefully millions of vials, but all I've learned is that whatever marketing tells me is wrong. So we'll see where that goes. But that's my goal, that's my job. As Tim said, um, a, my background is in chemical engineering. Um, so my other goal for this afternoon is to try and convince everybody here that contrary to a popular TV show that engineers are important, we do have a value. So I'll show you what that value is as we go through this process. Um, so when we talk about points to consider, I'll talk about the drug product side, which in our world, drug product really means putting the, the API, the active ingredient, into the final formulation that we put into a human. For example, a vial for a sterile product, or tablets and capsules for an oral dosage product, or topicals, creams, inhalation products, things like that. So Evan has talked a lot about points to consider with tech transfer and commercial manufacturing, but I'll just highlight and review a few of them too. In the industry, a lot of large pharmaceutical companies have both internal manufacturing and external manufacturing. Now for a small company, a virtual company, a lot of companies that we see here in the Cambridge area, um, we don't have the assets or the capital to invest in a large scale commercial plant. So therefore we outsource. We find companies that do this as a job. Um, there are a lot of companies around the globe that you can go reach out to and um, they'll take your process and transfer that process into a commercial scale. And that's what I did a lot of at Cubist. Now, how do we select that company that we want to work with? It's very much like a marriage, so it's very important you make a lot, you spend a lot of time on this decision. Um, and it doesn't always work out. One step is talking to them about your regulatory, their regulatory history. Are they approved? by the regulatory agencies that you will want to sell the product in, for example, the FDA in the US or EMA in, in the European Union. Um, that's key. What we found, as Tim said, 
we were working with one product that we had to go to a contract manufacturer that wasn't approved in the European Union. So therefore, we had to make changes and support their filing in the European Union in a very tight timeline. Another important consideration is around their capability. Um, so can they manufacture to your process? Do they have the equipment that you're asking them to use and to manufacture with? And the scale. So it's one thing if we have a product that we're trying to make a million vials of, but their capacity is to make a five million vial batch, for example. So you may have five years of sales, but you don't have the expiry to support that. So you're looking at discarding products. So scale and cap capability are also key as a review. And as part of the control part of this CMC, there's a lot of analytical testing that goes into each and every batch that we make. Um, so analytical testing, do they have the equipment, HPLCs, GCs, to do the analytical testing to help control that process? What you see in industry is a lot of contractors don't handle everything from phase one to phase three or even commercial scale. So what we end up with is you may work with one company that does phase one scale, a couple thousand vials, um, but then you're transferring, you have to find another company to execute your phase three manufacturing and commercial scale. And I'll get into more of the timeline and the activities that go into that transfer. And then lastly, packaging considerations. So this gets, this is often, too often an afterthought. We have our primary packaging for an injectable product is our vial, our stopper, our seal. And all too often that this is just selected based upon what the manufacturer has in house and not really thought out about how does this affect the stability? How does this affect our product in terms of leachables and extractables, things that can get into your product? Um, and then we have our secondary packaging, so labeling and cartoning and any insert that you're providing with that product. These are all important considerations. And sometimes you'll find a manufacturer that will do both the formulation and packaging. Oftentimes you have to find a completely different manufacturer that does the packaging. And this is what Tim was talking about. I still have nightmares about the antibiotic classifications. Um, so as we were working on this product, there was an FDA guidance that was published around non-penicillin and beta-lactam drugs and their cross-contamination. And they stated that you cannot produce certain classifications of antibiotics in the same facility. For example, cephalosporins cannot be made in a carbapenem plant or penicillins. So therefore, we were in the process of working in a plant that was making, I believe, a cephalosporin, and we had to move our product out of that facility into a dedicated facility because we had a combination product of the beta-lactamase inhibitor and a cephalosporin. Um, so this, was, this had to be done on a very tight timeline, and it completely changed the scope of the project and cost. So as we get into decision making, I'll talk a little bit more. We talk about requests for proposals or requests for quotations. All of this is where we reach out to a potential contract manufacturer. We ask them questions, like I said, about our, their regulatory history, their compliance history, their capabilities. And oftentimes we do an analysis in a, what we call a scorecard or a matrix. We make a decision based upon um, their risk, their answers to some of this. I would really say that this process can take two to three months. Um, it seems long, but by the time you have done the evaluation of multiple different um, sites, it can be a long process. Then you start getting into contracts. It's very important to have contracts in place to protect yourself uh, and to define what the scope of the agreement is. So we have supply or service agreements, and then we have our quality agreements that talk about the compliance aspects. Um, and lastly, we get into a quality audit. So most companies have a quality assurance organization that will go to a site and will perform a quality audit to make sure um, compliance with FDA or regulatory compliance or um, inspections. As we said, if there's any significant ob observations there, this really could affect the timeline significantly. Then we get into manufacturing planning. So once we've decided we're going to move forward with a contract manufacturer, we start talking about planning purposes. So in this scenario, we've said that we need 22,000 vials for phase three. 
and that each vial contains um, 150 milligrams of the active. So just based upon that, we need 3.4 kilograms. Doesn't seem like a lot. Then we add in development, any engineering that may, 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 we may wanna do. For example, we would take a process to a new contract manufacturer and we would wanna run a trial run to make sure that they can do this process successfully. And that material is generally discarded. And then we have stability. So stability helps define the expiry requirements for the product. Again, that is just testing requirements, not even material that would end up in a human. So there's a lot of waste, maybe the wrong word, but product that's not used um, that we have to consider. So really it could be two to three times the clinical need that was just defined as part of this program. So this is generally where I go to leadership and beg, grovel, ask for more money and more kilograms to be able to do the work that we need to do in drug product to demonstrate reliability and uh, success. Now get, getting into a timeline a little bit more, um, we talked about analytical method transfer and Drew will highlight some of the details of that. But in general, that's where we take our analytical testing methods to determine the purity of the product, potency of the product, and we transfer that to a site that will do the testing. This can take two to three months, um, even longer for more complicated test methods that are out there. And then we talk about process transfer, so teaching the contract manufacturer what the process is, what raw materials we use, ordering those raw materials. Some raw materials can have lead times of six months alone. Um, and then developing documentation. So as we said, GMP is very highly documentation driven. We have protocols, we have batch records that need to be written and approved. Um, and then we execute engineering trials. Again, just demonstrating that we can do this before we commit to producing product. And finally, our GMP manufacturing that will be used in the clinic. And then we have our stability program. So just some um, details on stability program that Drew will get more involved with. We have long-term stability, we have intermediate stability, and we have accelerated stability. All of these are used to help define with the regulatory agency what the expiry will be of the final commercial product. Now to throw another wrench in this whole scenario, Tim nicely has suggested that maybe we want to consider changing the product. Um, so our current, what we said in the scenario is our current drug product vials um, are lyophilized cake. So we freeze dry a solution and we get a nice lyophilized cake in the vial, but it's very inelegant. So you may get complaints from the end user that the cake is broken or the cake doesn't look good. Should I be using this? A lot of questions come back. Um, and lastly, the current stability is 15 months. 15 months seems like a long time, but when I just talked about that process, by the time you make the product and then you're able to release it to the market, you could be three, four, sometimes five months into that expiry. Um, so the end user may not want to take product that has only eight, 10, 12 months remaining on it. So what we've talked about with our formulation team in this scenario, is we need to look at some different excipients that may help our stability or that may help develop a lyophilized product that's more elegant, it looks better, maybe it reconstitutes faster. Um, so the, the formulation scientists will look at those excipients. They may work on developing a new freeze drying lyophilization cycle altogether. And then that has to go into stability testing. So they'll do research and development stability to even see if what they suggest works. And then we'll take that and scale that up and do a very similar technology transfer like I just talked about. Um, it's a whole new process essentially with different excipients, with a different process. So if we go back to our previous timeline, it could be six, nine, 12 months to get this new formulation from the formulation scientist into a product that we could use eventually. So there's a lot of questions there. It's a risk-based approach, it's a cost decision. Do we develop a new formulation for phase three? Or do we use this old formulation while it's very effective for humans? It may not look um, elegant. Um, are there issues with that? So a lot of companies may go forward with that and then develop a generation two product. So there may be a formulation change at that point and they'll roll out a new product a couple of years into the life cycle. 
So those are all the decisions we consider in terms of planning for commercial manufacturing. That's it. And now Drew will talk more about our regulatory aspects. Thank you, Mike. Our last speaker today is uh, Drew Parlo, or Barlow, who received his uh, Master's in Public Health from UNC Greensboro. Uh, following that, he worked at the FDA as a field compliance officer, and then joined Vertex just down the road in 2006, but since 2015, has been working with the regulatory consultancy Synergy. True. Yeah. Welcome. Hi. So we heard a lot about the, regulata the regulatory authorities, the regulators, um, but I just want to keep in mind that FDA, EMA, Health Canada, when it comes to new novel approaches in unmet disease areas, they really work hand in hand with farm school development teams, medical development teams, um, and really can be your best ally if you engage them early, often, and take a scientific and rational approach to the problem at hand. So the FDA, yes, is a regulator, but they're also a public health agency. And the FDA is, you know, it can be a debate between EMA and FDA, is one of the preeminent public health agencies in the world. So they have a really hard job where they're constantly doing risk assessments, prioritizing, um, and working with very confined budgets. So with that said, I'm going to go into a, a couple of these uh, regulatory CMC considerations. So within the world of regulatory, there's regulatory CMC, which is the chemistry manufacturing controls that works with your pharmaceutical development te teams. There's regulatory folks who are experts in non-clinical, clinical, clinical um, tox, all that. But I'm going to focus on, if you're familiar with regulatory filings like INDs and NDAs, how we have something called the Electronic, electronic Common Technical Document. Raise a hand who's heard of ECTD and CTD. All right. All right, good. So within that framework, it's, you know, I wish I had a graph, but it's basically a pyramid. Module one is all your like administrative stuff. Module two is your summaries. Module three is where I live, where these guys live, and that's the chemistry manufacturing controls. Four and five are clinical and non-clinical in reverse order. Um, but really, everything that we're going to talk, that we have talked about in the development timeline, feeds itself into how do we populate this module three? How do we give enough information to the agency to give them assurance that we can reproducibly manufacture drug, release drug, supply the market, um, but not giving them too much information where we're going to tie our hands down the road if something something happens? So that's this goes into pharmaceutical development and th those paradigms. Um, yeah, so, so with that said, you know, think with the end in mind. So it's, it's easy to sit here and wax philosophically where we want to really bridge, what you need to do is bridge the clinical program and the clinical program material to the desired end goal, which is the actual commercialized product. So if there's any disconnects, like I think we talked about lot one, two, three, four, and lot two, three, five, six, and lot three, four, five, six, and how there are slight variations of those lots, um, that the FDA needs to understand the development pathway, what happened between those changes between each of those lots, um, what material did you run your pivotal clinical studies in, because that is what FDA is basing safety and efficacy on for your commercial product. So once you have an approved NDA, FDA may take a look every once a year when you submit an annual report, but they don't really look at them because they don't have the budget. Um, they do inspections maybe every three years if you are a low, well it, well, it used to be every three years, regardless of the risk associated with the firm. Um, but now, you know, maybe every five, seven years, they'll actually come in and look at what you have. Uh, so the onus is on the company to prove to the agency that they can make reproducible, high quality material um, from day one. And that's why you hear horror stories of going back and forth with FDA and trying to get things accomplished um, during that review period. Um, the other, you know, another main bullet as you move from like development into commercial is this registration stability program. You'll see this terminology throughout the industry. It's either, you know, formal stability, um, registration stability, uh, the stability program for uh, registration, which is the, uh, which are those finite lots of material that you put in your module three to help set that shelf life, but also, um, again, gives the agency that you have the 
ability to manufacture and uh, reproduce quality material, but it also is the linkage to your pivotal clinical studies. So, you know, again, you run your pivotal clinical to show efficacy and safety. If you make significant manufacturing changes after you do your pivotal clinical studies and put that in module three, how do they know that those changes don't impact safety and efficacy? So, so again, that, that's, that's the link. And that's what we talk about doing like late phase three type BE studies to show bioequivalence and different sort of dosage form, dose forms. Um, so here, you know, registration stability, it's really a number of lots. You know, the, again, I'm gonna talk in generalities. Um, base cases, but if you have a breakthrough therapy that's an orphan drug and, you know, by those definitions could be an unmet medical need, the CMC reviewers at FDA are going to work with you to get that drug to market if you have positive efficacy and safety data. So what I'm going to say here is like the base case. So um, what you need is t basically three lots of drug substance, three lots of drug product. 12 months at the time of filing on each of those at those different conditions that Mike pointed out. So long-term, whatever your long-term storage condition is going to be. Um, that program, that stability program that's called registration in your module three needs to be a representative packaging of what you're going to commercialize. The process needs to be representative and the formulation needs to be representative. What does representative mean? Well, that's up for the experts within the firm to sort of dictate what, what is it, you know, how, how do we meet this definition of representative? And FDA, if you engage with them, will help you um, come to realization that maybe your definition of representative is not their definition of representative. Um, so that's, yeah, my next slide is sort of going to like those agency interactions. Um, yeah, and, and, and the other piece here is, so we talk about once you choose your site, once you have your process, you don't necessarily need it for the NDA, um, but you need to start planning your validation, your process validation planning. Now, you know, we talked a little bit about quality by design, which is setting these norms and these normal operating ranges and these proven acceptable ranges, um, doing different uh, PPQ batches, product performance uh, qualification batches, we talked about the N of three, how if you just do three, three batches in a row and everything comes out good, then you completed your validation. That has been the industry standard for forever. Um, there's a relatively new process validation guidance out there that EMA and FDA is sort of, um, well, not sort of embracing, they are embracing it because they wrote it, um, about you know, documenting your design your design of your process. So it goes into the normal pharmaceutical development. Um, but then writing yourself a, a protocol that initially enables you to maybe make one batch and meet certain criteria, move to the next phase, which is increased testing. So maybe you can do process validation with a single batch. Um, but again, it depends on the process and the product itself. And then the other, the other um, main consideration is this site inspection readiness. So we talk, I get pulled into a lot of conversations where it's almost too late, where a site has been selected, the NDA has been filed, they have never registered with FDA, they have never been inspected by FDA, they have never hosted an EMA or Health Canada or you know, another ICH country inspection, and there's pigeons flying through a sterile manufacturing suite. So, yeah, so, yeah, what, what can we do? So that's worst case. And then, you know, that has not happened before. Yeah, it has. Um, but, yeah. Uh, so getting your team early involved with the site selection process, you know, really don't, taking, don't take the firm's word for it. Go and visit, even if it's in China, even if it's, you know, multiple, you know, like a multiple day trip. Um, definitely. All right, so this is my eye chart where I was putting together a couple of slides on analytical method development and why analytical methods are important. Well, analytical methods are important because it's what you test your product with. Um, and you typically develop them in a single location and then they are transferred to multiple sites multiple times during the course of development. Methods are improved, they're tweaked, they're changed outright. Um, and it's one of those things where FDA has a lab. FDA has a lab in Philadelphia. FDA has a lab in St. Louis where you will provide your methods in the, in the NDA. 
FDA will then take those methods and take them to Philadelphia or take them to St. Louis and see if they could reproduce what you have produced. So A, FDA is doing its own method transfer based off of the information that you give them, and B, you're releasing all of your batches against these methods, and you really want FDA to get the same results that you are getting. Because um, part of this process is you actually, if FDA requests, you will send them samples of your drug to test. Um, uh, and there's a whole division with FDA now that basically concentrates on that. And this is, this is not because of non-compliance. This is not because, you know, they got a consumer complaint. It's not because there was some sort of, um, you know, new media event or some sort of catastrophe. It's routine part of the NDA approval process. Now, they may not always test, but they always have the right to do that. Um, so really here, you know, with, when it comes to analytical method development, work cross-functionally, be proactive. Um, as you develop your method, really know your samples. You know, are there any possible side reactions with any of the common solvents or diluents that you would possibly use? Um, you know, understand what you want to learn from each attribute you're analyzing. So not to say stick to those attributes that you think are important, um, but really that sort of should be your guiding your, your guiding focus. Um, again, think with the end in mind. What are your possible outcomes here? Um, it, you know, and, and really, I'm, so like, you know, we, we talked a lot about phase two, phase three in commercial, but you know, you have to have a fit for purpose method from, day, from phase one. So is it the best Cadillac version? Oh, that's actually, my boss used to say Cadillac version, but now it's probably should say BMW or, um, uh, Mercedes version, but um, yeah, so does that have to be the best method from day one? No, not necessarily, but know that like, you need to incrementally improve this method as you go, go through development. Um, and having a really well-written method, I mean, this is key, especially when it comes to NDA writing and, and providing information to the FDA, that you want them to be able to execute your method based off of the way that you've described it in your application. If there's ambiguity, they're not going to run the method correctly. You, and, you know, if you have a good chemistry reviewer, they may give you a phone call to sort of figure these things out. If you have one that's not necessarily as... Um, engaged and has multiple things to do in the same day, they may just say non-compliant or you may get an email or some handwritten piece that is really hard to react to in real time during the course of your NDA review. Um, and so the other piece of this you know, well-written method helps you transfer that method. Again, going back to the FDA in mind, having a well-written method is going to help them transfer that method. Um, but in your development, realm, again, well-written method, but then having the ability to assess the lab's readiness. Are the criteria set appropriately for them to execute that method? And then have them actually run exploratory runs at the receiving lab. So like, don't just go right into testing your material. Make sure it's set up, you're following a protocol. Um, uh, yeah, so that helps mitigate some, some risks. Uh, and then when you actually do your method validation, you know, again, pre perform feasibility studies, evaluate data throughout, set the appropriate sequence criteria. Um, but prior to actually initiating the actual validation protocol, because once you have a failure during the middle of your protocol, it's really hard to sort of backtrack from that um, and not, um, it just creates extra work if you're not properly prepared ahead of time. Um, yeah, and, and really, you know, learn, it's, it's a continuous learning curve. So take from what, take those aspects that you've learned from earlier in development and apply them to the actual validation criteria. Um, and, uh, you know, really just pay attention to the data they've generated in the past. All right. So who, has anyone in here participated in an actual FDA or regulatory meeting? Awesome. Cool. So I wanted, so FDA allows interactions during the course of development. Typically you see, when you go to any sort of clinical development team meeting, there's a nice Gantt chart with arrows and, you know, 2000, like present day is on the left and then, you know, way out to like 2022. There's clinical studies at the top. There's usually CMC timelines and milestones on 
when this lot of API is going to be available and when we're going to package. And at the bottom, there's usually a regulatory piece that has like usually, usually three little stars. One's like for pre-IND, one's for end of phase two, and one is like submit NDA. So I sort of want to talk a little bit about FDA interactions when it comes specific to CMC meetings. Um, and FDA will grant specific CMC meetings with the CMC team to talk through those CMC issues. Um, a lot of firms I work with find that they have to have a joint clinical, non-clinical, and CMC meeting. When you look at the way the FDA is structured, is that they're structured in a very similar way that any pharmaceutical company is structured, where the medical director doesn't want to care about, well, I shouldn't say that, but the, you know, they're not engaged in the development of API, or they're not, like your packaging configuration does not, like the medical director doesn't care about that. Um, but your CMC folks do, and I find that I've been to more meetings than I want to admit. Um, when they're joint, CMC are, the CMC team at FDA is basically the wallflowers that sit in the back that maybe get 10 minutes at the end of the meeting and you don't really get a lot of questions addressed. Um, if you have joint, if you have a single CMC meeting, they're front of the table, they're engaged, you start knowing these people by name because the teams don't change all that much, um, especially if, your, you know, you do your pre-IND to phase two and your relatively quick timeline, you're gonna see a lot of the same faces. Um, so I think, hands down, one of the most important meetings that any CMC team can have is the end of phase two. It's key to phase three, it's key to NDA success. And this is when you start talking about your starting materials or your regulatory starting materials, as we like to call them, um, your specifications, those impurities, those genotoxic impurities, and not just the impurities themselves, but how are you going to control for them? And you know, what are some of these overall control strategy things that we can do other than you know, add a basilica full of solvent to you know, do something? Um, talk about your stability protocols and any, any sort of issue you may have. Your site changes, if you're doing a site change at phase two to phase three, or maybe you need to introduce a new site at phase three to meet your clinical supply, is, is that being, so is that new site in place of the old site? What if 95% of the drug comes from the old site and only 5% comes from the new? Is FDA gonna ask you to do additional clinical studies? Or is it gonna ask you to do additional work to show that that new site is gonna be comparable to what you, the vast majority of your clinical data is based upon? Um, so this is a really good time to also talk about breakthrough status. Maybe not from a CMC perspective, but if your clinical program is getting breakthrough status, um, typically you could have this meeting before for that, um, that may that will a excite the CMC reviewers who sometimes don't get to be part of exciting programs, and b um, sort of lays the groundwork that you know what maybe we can't have three months or, or tw three lots of twelve months on drug product. Maybe two lots at nine and one lot at twelve, or some you know combination of permutation of that would be acceptable. This is sort of where you start laying that groundwork. Um, nine times out of ten the CMC team will be like, if you have breakthrough status, we will work with you to ensure that your NDA is filed in an appropriate time frame, you know, based off the clinical data, and maybe we'll do some post-marketing commitments to bring you up to speed um, to, to, you know, satisfy the basic requirements of an NDA filing. Um, yeah, so we talked about site changes and formulation changes, and really, li again, linking back to TOX, PK, PD, in your clinical studies. Um, you know, the other really important meeting is your pre-NDA. So which is typically right before, not right before, but you know, you have a good positive readout on your phase three, maybe nothing's you know, announced yet. You're planning your NDA. Six months to you know, a year before you submit your NDA, you can have a pre-NDA meeting where you basically take everything that you learned from your end of phase two, everything you learned from your phase three manufacturing, your initial campaigns, and you sort of confirm that you have a fileable package. Um, you confirm your filing strategy, so a, a rolling strategy. And there's different ways if you have these breakthrough or fast track statuses to get documentation to the FDA sooner rather than later. Um, and all that can be vetted at the pre-NDA. Um, you really need to confirm that your sites are ready for inspection with the agency at this time, because the last thing you want to do is build out this 
multi-million dollar process and facility, and they're not ready for inspection. F that is a refuse to file. So FDA, like, you've done all this work, and I go into some horror stories, not to end on a downer, but um, uh, you do all this work, and you submit your NDA, and you check a box that this facility is not ready for inspection, they're like, well, then we can't accept the application. Worst case scenario. Um, and then really, again, just ID any other potential problems that may arise during the course of re review. If, if you, as a development team, have an inkling that something is maybe not as good as it could be or is slightly amiss, don't think the FDA is not going to find it. I, I mean, address it early enough where you can have a, a mitigated strategy. There, there, there are so many people that look at these documents at FDA that someone's going to find something that's going to flag it, and you don't want it to happen during the course of your review. Um, all right, so this is like my, uh, how do we avoid some of these pitfalls? Um, so I've, I've touched on all this already. So like early and ongoing discussions with the agency. Um, so we talked about, so type A meetings are meetings that you don't really want to participate in. Maybe I'll back up just. So a type A meeting is like your program is stalled. You have some, there's some issue. The FDA is like you cannot proceed. It could be clinical, it could be manufacturing, it could be like patients don't exist anymore. I, I, I don't know. Um, those are, those are like one-off, I've never participated in a type A meeting. Um, type B are those meetings that are those um, milestone meetings. So pre-IND, end of phase two, pre-NDA, you're granted two or three depending on you know, the sort of agreement. Now I should say you're granted three. Um, the only difference, and there's like set criteria around, you know, you submit a request within 60 days, you have a meeting within 75, something like that. Um, a type C meeting is a meeting or a correspondence or a telecon that can occur any time during the course of development. Um, you reach out to your FDA project manager, hey, we have this issue, can we talk in you know, 30 to 60 days? Um, nine times, it depends on the nature of the program, but this is, I, this is a relatively underutilized avenue to interact with the agency. And not everything warrants a face-to-face, -face, and not everything warrants a telecon, but maybe you can do a Type-C meeting or um, correspondence, where you basically put together a package and FDA will respond in writing. Um, and that's outside of end of phase two, pre-IND, and pre-NDA. All right. Um, yeah, so early and ongoing discussions. I guess that was my point to go back to talk about Type-C. Um, early planning for stability, knowing that you may need 12 months, or you will need 12 months on three lots of drug substance and drug product. You look at your clinical timeline you, or your filing timeline and you count backwards. Like when can we be ready to have a representative process of a representative formu you know, yeah, pro formulation in representative uh, container closure system that you want to commercialize? It's, it's difficult. It's difficult. Um, and really, you know, um, Leverage previous experiences, again, to ensure that any changes that you're making are going to be okay. Um, earlier formulations and processes, um, container closures, so you can leverage those to help set out worst case scenarios to maybe present to an agency why you won't have a complete and full data package. Um, and then this other piece is really fostering CMO partnerships to ensure GMP. So this goes back to site selection, working with that CMO. FDA does not see a CMO as a, um, third-party standoff entity. They're considered a arm of your manufacturing division. They're considered equally responsible for producing the material that they're responsible for producing in the NDA. The NDA sponsor is ultimately responsible, but there is no passing the buck anymore. So it, you know, a negative compliance impact at the CMO site is equally and probably more damaging to the sponsor itself. Um, so really, don't treat your CMOs like CMOs. Treat them more like you know they're a partner in development with you. Because when it comes to prior approval inspection readiness, which is this PAI, they need to field questions from FDA inspectors and reviewers as if they developed the product themselves. Because if they can't answer basic questions on the drug product on, on development and process development, there's not assurance there that they can reproducibly make that process going forward for a number of years. So it really puts the onus on you know, the CMC guys and the CMC girls and women to really you know, work with the, those teams um, regardless of jurisdiction.
Um, yeah, and you know, quality agreements are sort of an afterthought. You have to, it's, if, if you're pointing to a, so you have to have a quality agreement, FDA says so, EMA says so, general GMP says so. But if you start pointing to quality agreements, if you're in like an argument with your CMO, it's, that relationship's already soured. It's, it's, it's too late um, if you have to point out subsections. Um, yeah, all right, good. So these next couple of slides, um, so everything I presented is really my opinion based off of my experience. Um, you know, I had a number of individuals in my, in our, our consulting firm sort of go through and do um, an analysis of, so drugs at FDA, you can review, review um, synopses of all drugs that have been approved for a number of years. Um, and then also just recent complete response letters. And these are all from publicly, this is all from, I think, Google searches, to be honest, looking for um, press releases from firms that have said, we submitted our NDA, and then dead silence, and then all of a sudden, something comes out that says, we got a complete response. So a complete response is your, FDA's, your, your NDA is not approved. It's not approved for these reasons. Um, a lot of times, they don't go into a ton of detail, but so how many do I have? So there's basically two slides, what is that, like nine of them? This is from the first half of this year. And these are all CMC issues or inspection issues. And we didn't take into any account anything that had a clinical or safety piece to it. Um, we deleted the names of the companies and the actual name of the drug just, even though it's all public information because I don't want to get caught up into, you know, reading drug names and whatnot. But, you know, really, I'll hit on some of them, but they'll be on the slides. Um, you know, complete response due to inspectional issues, lack of timely resolution and introduction of process changes too late in the review cycle. So this one specifically was a firm that basically failed an FDA inspection. They were told that this went horrible. They were given 30 or 60 days to respond. They didn't in a timely manner, so they've responded like day 62. Um, and then in the response to saying why we think we could fix these things, they introduced manufacturing changes into the response. So FDA is like, absolutely not, you can't do this, and complete response issued. Um, so there's treatment of uh, a, a glaucoma condition. Where, so again, they refer to a manufacturing issue. There was no efficacy or safety concerns. No additional clinical trials are, are um, needed. Basically just a GMP manufacturing issue. Um, next one down here, so uh, prevention of delayed nausea and vomiting. FDA requested additional information regarding an in vitro method utilized to demonstrate comparability of the drug product that was produced at two manufacturing sites that were included in the NDA. They didn't do that effectively, NDA is not approved. Or this may have been a prior approval supplement for a new, a new indication. Um, treatment of uh, Bacterial pneumonia, a complete response letter states that FDA cannot approve the NDA in the present form and notes that additional clinical safety information and the satisfactory resolution of manufacturing facility that deficiencies are required before the NDA can approve. So this was clinical safety information and the fact that there was manufacturing facility issues um, results in that complete response. Um, rheumatoid, arth rheumatoid arthritis drug um, during a routine Inspection, the facility, uh, basically just deficiencies in the manufacturing process um, in the last product step. Um, another, another failure because of manufacturing facility issues. A lot of manufacturing facility issues. Um, yeah, so I, but they're all, they're all basically the same. GMP issues at the time of approval. So really work with your, with your team there. Um, so this, this slide, I know it's hard to read, it's, um, but basically we looked at efficacy, safety, and review and labeling deficiencies for drugs that failed the first cycle. Um, so the, the majority, about 32% were efficacy deficiency only, 25% were safety um, deficiencies, and then 27 were safety and efficacy. CMC alone was about 12%. Um, and CNC and labeling. Um, so that just sort of just gives you five. So the, the take home from this slide is basically 5% of drugs never get approved from, due to some sort of um, deficiency. Uh, yeah. And then, so th this is another one that I, so 
there is an initiative within FDA called the GMP for the 21st century. Basically, it's an approach the FDA has taken on in the late 2000s where they're going to take risk-based approaches. Um, uh, they're going to embrace modern technologies, modern way of QC testing, and, and, and go out, talk to industry groups, um, get this collaborative environment together, um, which I really have seen. So I left the agency in 2006. It's come a long way. Your FDA inspectors, your compliance officers, it's come a long way where they're much more scientifically minded and, and rational when it comes to um, data-driven conclusions, to be honest. Uh, but so basically, th this slide says, an R RTF is a refuse to file. That means like you did, you wrote your NDA and you submitted it, and in the first 72 days or 60 days, um, FDA basically says this is not fileable, and they reject it. So, from 1998 to 2009, there was 15 refuse to file letters in 11 years. So from 2009 to 2011. There was a total of 13 in three years. And we, uh, so we haven't done the analysis recently. This came from a paper, and I could give, I, the sources are in, in one of the slides. Um, but, you know, basically 29% of the RTF reasons were CMC issues. So I, I expect that trend to continue, I think. And then these are a couple members of my team that helped put together some slides and worked on the poster and did some of the data analysis. So I thank them. All right. Cool. Good. Thank you, Drew. Thanks. So before we get into some of the questions, maybe just a, a brief summary of what I think we've heard. Uh, we'll be ready for phase three on time, uh, <laughs> uh, for sure. Uh, but uh, importantly, I think what I've, I hope we've shared with our company, with this team, um, is that the requirements on CMC are significant and not to be ignored. Um, that we have to do really careful for planning right now in order to be in a position in two or three years uh, to meet a, a market uh, requirement. And that will, uh, in part, go back to the TPP that, uh, that John talked about earlier, is hanging a lot of our requirements onto that early thinking. And it could be in terms of cost, because we know what the price has to be. And $1,000 a gram, there's not many uh, drugs that can really uh, compete at that price point. Um, Second, we have to think carefully about that end, uh, because these investments are made when we don't know if it's going to even be approved. Uh, we're making significant investments in capital, in our CMOs, in our time, and sending people all over the world uh, to do these things while we're still doing the clinical trials. So it rewards careful thought early on. Uh, critically, as the sponsor, we own everything. So we work through CMOs, we work through CROs, but their quality is ours, uh, and we, we cannot uh, delegate that accountability. Um, so we talked about quality agreements, we talked about the importance of working that in, but fundamentally, um, if an inspector knocks on our CMO's door, that inspector is knocking on our door, um, and it's important that we have full faith and confidence uh, in them. And then finally, uh, what I think I've heard is uh, engagement and collaboration with our uh, regulatory authorities early and as often as the lettuce come by is probably a great idea. Is that a reasonable summary? I would say so. Great. Well, we, um, I'm really happy that we have quite a few questions. I'm not sure that we'll be able to get to all of them, um, but they're uh, across the board here. Um, and maybe I'll start with this one that just came in. Uh, can you talk more about that inelegant cake, uh, uh, Mike? <laughs> and do you really get calls about usability of a broken cake? Do people actually look at that product before they dissolve it? Yeah, so thanks for throwing that in the presentation, yeah. You're so, welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> it is a real world example. So um, yes, you will. You're, firm may get calls about a cake appearance. Um, people in the field, pharmacists reconstituting the product may question whether or not the product is appropriate to use. Um, some other examples maybe, we've received calls about slow reconstitution time, or there are some defects, critical defects, like if you had a crack or chip in the glass vial that was uh, produced. Some of these could even lead to investigations or trigger recalls in some examples. So. There is, every part of the quality organization is tied into a cl complaint department and an assessment's done of those complaints and evaluation and the impact of that product. So um, there are multiple, you'll receive many different complaints potentially. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And, and just to add to that, you know, for oral uh, products, uh, you may have a specification or your label says it's a, it's a white tablet um, and it's quite common during tableting to have the lubricants or some uh, something from the tablet press or something 
get in the tablet and it's completely safe, but you'll end up with black spots. Uh, and so somebody will look at it and say, you've got black spots, this can't be good, is it mold? Legitimate concerns. Um, so so you, you will get concerns about things that you don't necessarily think are a problem. And that's why a lot of tablets are film coded. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Coach your tablets. Different colors. Uh, we had a couple questions about uh, GMP. So we talked a bit about uh, starting materials and about what is a GMP step. So uh, it wasn't clear uh, why starting materials and intermediates are not made under GMP. So what distinguishes that work done for a GMP versus a non-GMP step? Um, and when is it required? So, so I'll just say, um, and then I'll let Drew and, and Mike uh, weigh in. So uh, GMP, um, uh, it has some specific connotations, not the least of which I alluded to, was great mounds of paper. You have to have everything documented. So that the personnel uh, operating the equipment has to be properly trained, the equipment has to be recently calibrated, it has to be appropriately cleaned. All of these things require time and that requires money. So you want to limit your GMP steps to as late uh, stage as possible. Uh, the reason you don't do everything GMP is, is namely that not everything needs to be GMP. So for example, if you're buying uh, a commodity starting material, for example, 7-ACA, which is a uh, core of uh, 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 cephalosporins, that's made on hundreds of tons scale. And it's not done GMP because GMP will require specifications and all of the different suppliers they're buying it from may have their own specifications. And in fact, uh, because it's a commodity used so early, uh, having such rigorous control over the quality is not necessary because you can mitigate, as we heard earlier, there's risk-based approaches, you can mitigate any risk of having uh, something in your commodity starting materials uh, by purging them later. So essentially, it becomes a risk assessment. Um, the uh, European, uh, the EMA, issued a perspective maybe three years ago on selection of regulatory starting materials. And there's all sorts of other papers on this and, and perspectives and different opinions. Um, it's a long uh, way of going about saying that essentially you need to take a risk-based approach and make an argument. Um, and you have to be prepared to defend that argument for what constitutes your GMP starting material. What constitutes your, your first control point in the process. Again, the C is for control. So you, you want to be sure that everything that comes in with your GMP starting material um, is controlled or purged throughout your process. So I don't know if there's anything anybody wants to add to that, but. Um. Yeah, I mean, well, so GMPs are defined by, in the US, 21 CFR 210, 211, which applies to finished pharmaceutical products, right? But then there's other guidances out there that talk about the API and intermediates that, you know, those same principles apply, but, you know, the law says GMPs apply to the final stroke that you take. Thank you. Uh, here's a uh, question for Mike and Drew. We talked about version two of our drug, the now elegant uh, cake, I'm sure. Um, what's gonna be required to introduce that into the clinic? Um, let's say that it's actually now formulated and we're forecasting it'll have 24 to 36 months stability. What do I gotta do in order to start using that in clinical trials and beyond? Yeah, so maybe I can start about the technology transfer part. We would do something very similar, we would, work with transferring that process to a contract manufacturer, uh, demonstrate the process viability um, at that contract manufacturer, execute any stability studies to support that, and um, then work with regulatory around the filing aspects of it. So it's very similar to almost introducing a whole new product altogether. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so from the regulatory filing perspective, you would include you know, basically comparison of the old drug versus the new drug, the formulation of the new drug, and the essential, um, you know, basically comparable stability. Those, those typical data points that you need to include. Um, yeah. And if it's in the middle of a clinical study, then you have to wait for FDA, or, you know, basically European approval. If you file a new CTA, then it's a little easier, but it sort of depends on the very detailed aspects of the, the filing itself. Thank you. Okay. Clinical program, sorry. Thank you. So here's a question. We were going to throw this in as a, a game-changing scenario, but it's a better question asked. Um, what are the acceptable limits of impurities, and how can you be sure that even traces of these are not toxic? Asked another way, um, could the toxicity of the drug be as a function of trace impurities? So let's say that during the course of development, we identify a new uh, impurity, process-related, that's at 0.16%. Um, 
Evan, how would you, how would you digest that? So uh, uh, what defines your acceptable level of impurities is um, what you've qualified. So what that means is you, you the ICH and, and the FDA, and uh, they've agreed uh, through the ICH to um, have acceptable levels of impurities, and it's all a risk-based approach. So what that means is you can assume uh, up to, I think it's a 10-gram dose per day, uh, that you can accept up to 0.15 uh, percent of an unidentified, unspecified impurity. So during the course, I'm sorry, two grams. Uh, during the course of your development, uh, if you d do some process change and you find a new impurity greater than 0.15 percent that you have not seen before and was not in a tox lot, you must identify that and qualify it. Um, you can also establish, um, so uh, for peptides, the European Pharmacopeia says that you can uh, do up to 1%. Again, that's risk-based. Often peptides are, are deemed non-toxic uh, on their own, so you can assume that if it's a related substance, which means very structurally related, you can make an assumption that the toxicity profile will be the same. So ultimately, your impurities are going to be set by what you've deemed appropriate. So your dose uh, is deemed safe based on your tox studies, and so that is uh, um, transferable to the impurities. If you've dosed that impurity at that level, you can dose, you've you now have established a safety profile for those impurities in your material. If it's not in that material, then you have to go identify it and qualify it. Thank you. Uh, Mike, is it common for uh, having multiple CMOs in both early and late stage uh, development. I'm thinking about your example of a uh, vialing site that operates at, say, 1,000 vials per batch versus maybe a 50,000 vial batch. And how do you uh, manage and control the transfer among those, uh, among those two? Yeah, so I would say it's not common to have one contract manufacturer that may handle small volume to large volume. Um, so it is quite common then to need to do some transfer to another contract manufacturer. Um, in some instances where you're working with a small manufacturer and transferring to large scale, um, they'll support, you could support, um, but I would strongly suggest that the, um, the company representing the product manage that organization. In other situations where there are competition, you'll see that they would not support um, or they may require, there may be a cost or a fee for doing such a transfer of knowledge so it all depends on the CMOs that you're working with, the contractors that you're working with, their size, what their capabilities are um, between both sides. Thank you. And uh, Evan, in your example, you mentioned staging some starting materials. Uh, how early in that process of starting the phase three drug substance manufacture would you trigger that purchase? Yeah, that, so that, uh, that's, the answer is depends. Uh, depends on how long it, it is uh, to, to produce the material and how much uh, appetite for risk you have. So um, you want to stage your intermediates so that you have your GMP supplier ready to go should you need more material. Um, what happens with a lot of GMP manufacturers is uh, it costs them money to have a plant, so they try to fill it up as much as possible. So if they have uh, plant time that you've reserved, say three months in the third quarter, to produce uh, your 10 kilo batch, um, you want to stage everything so that if you need to resupply because of some batch failure or something else, you're not uh, asking them to hold a slot because then you're paying for that slot. So in other words, you, you make your 10 kilos and five of it uh, gets destroyed on shipment and you need to resupply. Now you're in the fourth quarter and in, if you were to go all the way back to the earliest you could do would be the second quarter of the next year. So if you want to be ready, you're going to have to essentially have materials ready to go when you start your GMP to do more uh, supply if necessary. Thank you. Uh, Drew, you mentioned working with the regulatory agencies when you have a breakthrough uh, therapeutic and you can engage early and often and perhaps do some uh, post-marketing commitments. Uh, do you see any foreseeable, reasonable changes we can expect from regulators to better match CMC timelines to what we're seeing in the clinic? Yeah, good question. Um, so I don't know if there's going to... 
So there have been multiple initiatives within the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, within FDA, where they, they realize that CMC now is really on the critical path when it comes to um, unmet medical needs, the oncology division, um, oncology type products where, you know, you have genotyping and there's really, s s you know, small patient populations um, where breakthrough status is granted. So to answer the question, I don't know if there's anything codified or coming down the pike to actually have an FDA stance on this, but clinical data really drives the FDA's actions, and the CMC team won't be, get in the way of, of, of the medical community's feeling towards something unless there is, you know, not enough data to support, you know, a, a quality manufacturing process, um, you know, from the CMC perspective. So it's, okay. it's uh, good. Can I ask a follow-up? Yeah. Please. So, um, uh, we talked about uh, registration batches, clinical supply, and validation batches all requiring their own time, cost, and material. Um, can you make all three at once? Yes, but n yeah, yes, but that's that's, an, that's a qu great question to vet and, and pose to the agency. Not just the question, but like the entire plan and justification yeah. of yeah. why why this is okay. Yeah. So right, typically your drug substance batches go to make your drug product, but that's just because we don't want to waste material, yeah. right? You, uh, you want to use your drug substance batches in your drug product, but if timing doesn't allow, then no, there is no regulation that says that that has to occur. Right, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll take a stab at this one. There was a question on additional con uh, considerations for weight-based doses versus a flat dose that we've uh, posited for, uh, for X1. And certainly there are. Um, uh, the questions you'd have to ask your uh, clinical team and also your marketing team are really who are your patients? Um, uh, from our perspective, we want to limit the number of SKUs or limit the number of presentations that we have to stock, control, and carry. Uh, so an ideal world would be a one vial to rule them all, for example, that can cover all your patients across whatever the weights are. Um, certainly that's not the case, but if you could identify what maybe 70% of your patients are and target a vial that would meet them, then you can multivials uh, for bigger patients and, you know, frankly, either uh, share that vial across the day for lighter patients or just deal with the, the losses. But I'll ask my colleagues if they have other uh, considerations on weight-based dosing specifically from a CMC perspective. Yeah, so I think that's a great point on the multi-different product presentations. Um, you will see a lot of products in the market that are, you'll use a vial and um, the end user will only extract part of that vial dependent upon patient weight. So there is some waste to that vial, but you're also, you would see more waste in the process if you had to create five different um, vial quantities, for example, 150 mig, a 250 mig, a 500 mig vial. Um, so you'll see that in the industry used to tell the end user to only extract part of the vial depending upon patient weight. And each of those vials would have to go on stability and exactly. require method validations and all of that. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Um, this leads to another question. Uh, at what time in development do you determine that the drug will be compatible uh, with the infusion sets, um, so the uh, IV uh, components, um, and you know, how do you test for that? Uh, I can tell you the short answer is earlier than you think, uh, and certainly before you use any of those infusion sets in the clinic. Um, and that does require additional work, additional supply, and additional cost and time in order to ensure that you're uh, compatible with a Baxter set. And this is even before we do the later stage extractables, leachables yeah. at, at uh, uh, greater quantity and greater expense before filing. Any other comments there? Excellent. Um, we talked a little bit about beta-lactams um, and the need to segregate. So there were two questions here. Um, what are the additional uh, testing or manufacturing considerations that you would do to address the possibility of hypersensitivity? Uh, uh, with the class, and are there other classes of compounds that also carry uh, that black mark of beta-lactamism, I guess? Uh, so I'll start with the, um, the hypersensitivity. Uh, I would imagine that's uh, an EHS and uh, assessment, and what is your acceptable limits of exposure during processing? But yeah, I mean, uh, anytime you walk on a facility that's manufacturing beta-lactams, they're going to ask you to fill out some form that says I'm not allergic or if you are that you'll be in the designated areas. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. Yeah, so there is testing that can be done by the manufacturing facility to demonstrate the lack of presence or control around the environment, any, um, any penicillins or product in the air in general. Um, and then there are other compounds, so um, cytotoxins, um, chemotherapies would be done in a not necessarily dedicated facility, um, but you would have to justify that there's no cross-contamination or impact to other products. <laughs> Um, hormone therapies are another uh, category that I can think of that would be done in a dedicated facility or at least dedicated equipment and would need to be justified that you're not impacting other products. Okay. So for cytotoxics and steroids and some of these other things, there are a lot of manufacturers that, that will have highly potent containment facilities, so they have facilities dedicated not for a specific class of compound, but for the idea that you're going to have cytotoxics, uh, gemcitabine and things like these that are really, really toxic, warheads for ADCs and so on. Um, what's interesting is uh, you would think that you would need greater containment for those than you would beta-lactams, but in fact, no facility, uh, in my experience, that does those would handle beta-lactams. So they're more afraid of beta-lactams than they are of uh, cytotoxics. So uh, our company, everyone in this room, as about 200 people, is pretty large for a startup, but uh, effectively tiny for a drug company. Um, so the question is, if your internal expertise is Im limited uh, in terms of reach and scope into the, some of these activities, uh, how do you go about finding trustworthy consultants to advise and oversee on some of these uh, activities and ensure that they're acting in, the, in your best interests? Um, you know, I'll start with mine. It's all about who you know and who you've worked with before uh, and, and networking in that way. But I'll pause there and ask, uh, ask the same question of the panel. Who do you trust? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I would just add that um, uh, it, it almost doesn't, yes, you need to have good consultants if you don't have the expertise. But I think one thing that, um, that, that I've found is um, you, the deliverable is not necessarily the kilos or the vials, it's the technology that can be transferred anywhere and be, has to be owned internally to go to the regulators. So if you don't have that expertise, don't rely on the manufacturers. Make sure you have a consultant that has that expertise and is available to you um, uh, and not just delivering the material. Okay. Yeah, I, I, like word of mouth. I mean, we, yeah, word of mouth and then you know, <clears throat> what Evan said really Having someone with your best interest in the facility that represents you, not necessarily the CMO, is, yeah. is the right way to go. Because a lot of times, again, we, <clears throat> from the regulatory perspective, I get pulled in, and we're interfacing directly with a CMO who doesn't have the best, doesn't have the same interest as the sponsor of the NDA or the sponsor of the IND. So. Yeah, I agree. Word of mouth is great. Um, that's a great way to understand the background. Um, I would interview or have. Yeah multiple discussions with that person on what their expertise is and there's contracts that go along yeah. with that too so yeah statements of work requests for proposals treat them like you were treating any other trying to hire another normal employee put them through the interview process okay yeah. and i'll uh have this as the last question as we could uh we put a one thousand dollar a gram cost for our api uh, and the question came in is, are, uh, what are you smoking? Um, is that typical of an early product? Um, what is a typical cost and what are key determinants to cost? Um, I'll say that's not atypical <laughs> of, of early development. $1,000 a gram, $1 million a kilo is about right for early stage. But I'll stop there and uh, uh, poll everyone else. Is that numbers that you're used to seeing? Yeah. I would agree definitely for biologic products or antibiotics. Um, for some small molecule organic synthesis compounds, they can be much cheaper, but um, what we're talking about here, that's, yep. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 uh, the thing with antibiotics, as we all know, is they tend to be higher dose than other therapeutic areas, and that requires more material. Um, coupled with what we heard earlier about uh, the complexities of natural products and, and other antibiotics from their chemical properties means that some of the compounds you might have thought of um, for oncology or the therapeutic areas where the very simple chemistry uh, is not applicable. Therefore, the chemistry usually to make antibiotics is, is much more complex uh, and therefore more expensive. Wonderful. Well, with that, uh, we're off to phase three. So thanks, everybody, uh, for your participation in today's kickoff. Um, and I'm certain we're going to have a successful program, and we'll, again, supply it in full and on time. And with that, I'll turn it back over to John. Let's give a hand you. to Team X1. <laughs> <laughs>